Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Carpegas. I'm the sales here at B2B. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's turned out to be a great event. And I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Paul Judge from Barracuda Networks. He's their chief research officer. Uh, his company, PureWire, was acquired by Barracuda four years ago. And he's continuing to be his chief research officer. I've seen Dr. Judge speak. I don't need to uh, put him at ease here, but he is a dynamic speaker. You should enjoy this very much. Thank you.
All right, so these are great things that have made life better, but they have disrupted the traditional way that we, we did security. So one of the things that's happened is the rapid growth of the web. We live at a point in time where every day there's 100,000 new domain names registered. Every day, it's more than one per second. One new domain name every second. So if you think about the traditional way that as an industry we, we secure the web, we basically, all the web security companies have rooms full of people, maybe this many people, and we all have a computer, and you would spend your day, you'd come in at 9 in the morning, and you would leave at 5, we might do split shifts to cover the clock, but everybody would have a computer and you would browse the web all day and say, oh, that's business, that's information. That's more fair. That's boring. <laughs> <laughs> just, that's how you spend a day. And I know when I was at Secure Computing, I, I was responsible for one of those teams. We had 80 people, and that's what they did. And with 100,000 domains a day, you can't type that fast. So it's really disrupted how the industry has dealt with web filtering and web classification. Another disruption, ajax based apps, Web 2.0, dynamic web apps, whatever you like to call it. Right? These are the things that brought us. Anybody use Outlook Web Access? Yeah, it feels like you're at a desktop nowadays. It feels like you're running out of it, right? Uh, anybody use a Google Spreadsheets? Yeah, like a spreadsheet that runs in the browser, it feels like you're running Excel. Right, so the power of that, this Ajax space, all these asynchronous calls, but what's happening is all of a sudden, a remote website has more control over your desktop than ever before. Right, so it's brought us all these great things, but all of a sudden, a remote website has more control over your desktop than ever before. And an app is no longer an executable that you download. Remember back in the day, you would say, okay, I need to figure out if this app is safe or not. And you would have an executable, you would download it, you would virus scan it, you would look for a signature. Okay, this app is good, then I will install it. Well, nowadays, an app is just a web app, it's thousands of XML HTTP requests going back and forth. So how do you tell if this is good or not? Right? So there's really a disruption in the traditional way that we as an industry tell if an app is safe or not. Another big change, user-generated content. There's some stuff out there, I think one's called Facebook, one's called Twitter. I mean, you guys use those, do you? <laughs> yeah, no. uh, so the point here, so what has happened? Remember the last time we actually educated the world about internet security? We told the world, go kind of ask my mother. Say, hey, how do you know you're safe online? Oh, you see the little lock at the bottom of the browser. I see the little lock, everything's fine. The world is safe. Oh, there's a lock, everything's fine. Right? Well, that mattered when it was domain level trust. I need to know if this domain is trustworthy or not. But now we live in a point in time where behind that domain is 100 million people, there's 500 million people. Right, so it's not a question if that domain is safe or not, it's a question, how do I tell these 100 million people are safe or not? So there's this gap, because the web is based on domain level trust, but the need nowadays is for user level trust, and it doesn't exist properly. And so the attackers are taking advantage of that. So I'll spend some time looking at the types of attacks we've seen on Facebook, the types of attacks we've seen on Twitter, kind of where they're spending their time. Another big change is, I think back kind of five, six, seven years ago, this weird thing happened. People used to uh, wake up in the morning and put clothes on and drive to the office and go to work. I right? actually used to wake up, put clothes on, and now a day. So many, many of you are laughing because nowadays you roll over, you grab your laptop, you don't brush your teeth, and you're working, you're on the clock. Right? The point is there's a lot of remote employees. And you see some stats here. Basically, about a fifth of the workforce works remotely. About one in every 10 organizations had a remote worker affected and about half of those infections came from visiting malicious websites. Right, so what happened is, as companies, we built up these infrastructures and perimeter-based things. If I come into the office, I plug into the internet, I'm behind the firewall, I'm behind the gateway, I'm behind all these things, I'm safe. I pick up my laptop to go across the street to a coffee shop, go across the country to a conference, I'm out there and I'm netting, I'm exposed, and then I bring it back to the office. And so the attackers are, are taking advantage of that. Uh, another thing that's happening, very closely related, new devices. Right, as we were walking in, I saw some iPads, I saw some Androids, some iPhones, some Blackberries. The line is blurred between what's your personal data, what's your business data, who owns the device, if you own the device, if the company owns the device. These are things that you didn't have to think about five, six, seven years ago as you were designing up your security policies. Right, so the attackers are taking advantage of this, this blending between personal and business data, personal and business devices. So with that, those are just five things that have happened. We've all sat here and watched them happen. We've all experienced them. They've all been good things. But they disrupted the traditional ways that we secure users online. And so the attackers are realizing that. Remember, they're sitting there and so they feed their kids and pay their bills. So they're looking at what's going on and trying to figure out ways to make more and more money. And so to look at now are some of the things that the attackers are taking advantage of, some of the types of attacks that we see showing up day after day that take advantage of some of these gaps. So one of the first ones, I go through about four of these. One of the first ones is the use of malicious JavaScript. 
right? So JavaScript is a thing that powers, like that Outlook web access, right? It gives you that real-time alerting to pop up. It, it powers the Google Maps, so you can drag and click it. It gives you kind of all of that, that real-time response. But with all that control, the attackers are taking advantage of it. So here's one example. As a real example, this is usatoday.com. And one thing that the attackers realize is that if they want to go after you or they want to go after your users, they don't necessarily have to attack your website or your network. They can attack your partners or other people that you rely upon. So usatoday.com, like many legitimate websites, actually relies on advertising to help pay the bills. And so what the attacker did in this case is they built an ad that was advertising a piece of software. They put a little piece of malicious JavaScript in it. They dropped the ad into an advertising network. This case was called IDA Trinity. And that was the advertising network that USA Today used. So all of a sudden, that malicious ad made its way through the network, showed up on usatoday.com. So you're a normal user trying to read what's going on in the world today, and you're serving malicious ads, and you're infected with rogue antivirus. Right, so it's an attacker just making use of a little piece of JavaScript, and instead of even attacking a legitimate domain, just attacking a third party partner that they rely upon. Right, so that's, that's kind of one thing that we see. Here's an example of an attacker actually going directly after the main site. Uh, so this site is pbs.org, and it's for Curious George. Anybody remember Curious George? Yeah, I thought you guys laugh and you're thinking back to childhood. He hasn't aged a bit, he's still a seven year old monkey. <laughs> <laughs> he's seven year old, so all this movie by the seven year old in your school. Uh, it's amazing. He hasn't aged a bit. He's still out there. So this is a website for parents and teachers. What the attacker did is this blue background you see at the top, they caused it to come from dipsy.pbs.org instead of www.pbs.org. Right? This was a, another machine within that network that was trusted, but one that was compromised. And so what happened is you went to this website and you get this pop-up. It says authentication report. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. You press OK, you press cancel. The only choices that you have, either one that you press, you get to this screen that says, hey, you failed to log in, don't worry, this was intended for PBS employees only, click here to continue to the regular website. Okay, no problem, PBS has a couple problems, I keep going. Well, while you were busy reading that message, this little piece of obfuscated JavaScript was running at the bottom of your browser. Anybody read obfuscated JavaScript? No? <laughs> well, what this thing does is actually serve up an invisible iframe that serves up an exploit kit, that's attacking your Acrobat Reader, your AOL Radio, your Alpha QuickTime, and about three or four other things. So here you are looking for information about Curious George, and the next thing you know, there's seven different attacks that run across your browser. So this is the type of thing that we see day after day, these legitimate sites that are compromised, what I think of as, as good sites going bad. Right, so you think again about the traditional way of the industry we classify and secure stuff on the web, we have these databases, 20, 30 million URLs, and say, oh, these are good ones and these are bad ones. But nowadays, you know, this follow these good sites that are going bad, they, they happen very quickly. Uh, here's a, a, actually a piece of software, an uh, engine that we developed. Uh, it's called Malicious JavaScript Detector. Uh, what it does is look at signs of illegitimate JavaScript usage. Uh, basically looking for things that are attacking the browser. So we're able to evaluate JavaScript in the cloud and see what is this trying to do for this person's browser. Do I see too many uh, create elements? So if someone's trying to do uh, overplay or heat spray on this browser. Do I see uh, invisible iframes? Do I see JavaScript being evaluated or created on the fly? Do I, I see uh, cookies that are intended for one domain being used and passed to another domain? So we're able to look at this JavaScript on the fly and understand what it's trying to do to this user before your user's running. Right, so